more fun question here, which uh, Jane and I can perhaps both answer. And the question is, what aspect of phonetics, what part of phonetics, attracts you the most? <laughs> so now, Jane, what do you like about <laughs> phonetics? <laughs> To be honest, at the moment, I'm, I'm liking it that nobody else understands anything about what I do. I feel very sort of individual and, ha, I've got all this knowledge and you don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's just my department, really, because the, my department's mostly applied linguists and they don't really understand phonetics at all. Um, but I think the thing that attracted me most um, to phonetics in the beginning um, was that it all made so much sense and it was so logical. And I just liked the way that you could write down what somebody had said um, in as much detail as you wanted, or you could really listen and get all the detail. You could explain some things, um, and it, it just really, it, it really made such a lot of sense to me. And I think from that point of view, it's always something that I've enjoyed. I felt a very kind of natural affinity with it. Um, incidentally, a lot of um, ph phoneticians are also musical. Um, <laughs> Professor Wells is musical too. I'm so is Professor <laughs> Setter. <laughs> yes, yeah, uh, Professor Pro um, Peter Roach is also musical. I know a lot of um, phoneticians who are musical, and it seems to go with it. If there are any um, uh, phoneticians out there who are not musical at all, please put up your hand. <laughs> I don't. I don't actually play an instrument, but um, I'm a singer, I, and I I hear things very well. If something's out of tune, it drives me crazy. So, um, but basically, I think it's just. It just that it makes so much sense to me. I think that's the thing that I like most about it, in a way that some things never did. So, what about you, John? Well, from our earlier discussion, I think we've both had very similar experiences. When I discovered phonetics, I knew that was what I wanted to do. That's absolutely <laughs> fascinating. Absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> and I'm obsessed by it. And I, I mean, I feel terribly fortunate in that I've been able to make a career out of something that interests me so deeply, mm -hmm. and which I do with such pleasure and such interest. What do I not like about phonetics? Well, I get bored marking its students in essays. <laughs> <laughs> After I've marked 20 essays on estuary English, I'm very bored by essay number 21, and by essay number 50, I'm screaming. <laughs> but that's uh, an experience that any teacher has, of course. We have, to, we have to do various routine tasks because they're part of the job. I get a bit bored with experimental phonetics, I must be honest. When I came to do the Masters in Phonetics at University College London, I'd previously been purely an arts student. I'd studied classics, Latin and Greek, so archetypal arts. And I was told, if you want to be a phonetician, you must get to grips with experimental phon phonetics. You must learn about the physics of speech. You must learn to make measurements, you must learn to draw and use graphs, and do all the other things you have to do in experimental phonetics. So, because I wanted to be a phonetician, I worked hard, and I learned to do this, and I did an MA dissertation in which I measured the formants of the monophones of RP, and I had to demonstrate, if you like, that I could do that. Having successfully demonstrated that I could do that, I more or less resolved just not to do it anymore. <laughs> Because that's not what I'm good at, it's not what I'm interested in. It's better to leave that to people who are good at it and are interested in it. And of course, the great advantage is that I do now understand what they're talking about and I can interpret their findings and so on. But I'm going to leave it to them to do all the measurements in the laboratory. And I think probably everybody would best be advised to do the things they're interested in. Because if you're interested in something, you'll be good at it. I love making lists. When I was a little boy, I made lists of things in the house, you know, <laughs> lists of toys, lists of whatever. <laughs> so that was a good basis for making a dictionary. <laughs> and of course, making a dictionary has its dull moments. You've got to go on and on and on and on. It means you have to work for a long time because it takes a long time to do it all. But there's sufficient interest in it for me, being interested in lists and interested in phonetics, to carry me through until successful completion. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, from my point of view, I have to say that I worked on EPD 15. Um, I did most of the club work on EPD 15, and it 
bored me solid. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I never had to compile the list to start with. That was that was already there, and the publishers augmented it. Um, there is something else I'd like to say. This is a very romantic notion, possibly, but I think um, one of the reasons that I was so interested in speech and how speech sounds um, was actually the film My Fair Lady. Uh, that was one of my favourite films. I loved the film, I loved the musical. I had the DVD and the CD and the video and, and everything. These people in Hong Kong. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it just fascinated me. And I think that's, that's one of the things that interested me most. And the idea that somebody like me, who comes from a small town on the coast, <laughs> could sound half decent if somebody bothered to make me speak proper. So that's what my regional accent sounds like. <laughs> And here I am today talking to you, and you can understand me, and I think that's marvellous. So that's another reason. Um, just the idea that somebody can totally change their identity if they learn to speak in a particular way in English. And this whole thing, speaking English, learning English, thinking about how you sound in English, what you can say in English, and being able to listen, I think that's the thing, that's one of the things that attracted me the most. And also, I, I just love the songs as well in the film. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually enables us to segue smoothly into the next question, <laughs> to use a musical term, <laughs> which is as follows. Please show us how Professor Setter's pronunciation is different from Professor Wells's. <laughs> <laughs> With some examples. Because Professor Setter told us in room 501 that she speaks, well it says Estua English, estuary. I think it must be Estuary No, I actually English. said I thought that you would say that I spoke Estuary. I wouldn't be so rude. <laughs> <laughs> it's a serious question. It's also a silly question. And we did consider answering it by telling you just don't be so stupid. For all practical purposes, our pronunciation is identical. On the other hand, Jane is much younger than me, so it's no surprise at all if my pronunciation is in some respects conservative compared with hers. And that is the case. We can see various examples of that. We talked about the ur diphthong and words like sure becoming sure. Now, Jane, you, I think, would normally say sure. Sure. If you ask me what sure. I say, I'll probably tell you I say sure. But if you listen carefully and catch me unawares, <laughs> half of the time you'll notice I say sure. And I know that from having studied tapes of myself talking. So I don't necessarily have the ability to report accurately on my own speech. Nobody does. I represent an earlier generation, halfway between sure and sure, which means that sometimes I go one way, sometimes I go the other. My father, or certainly my grandfather, would consistently say sure. The next generation consistently says sure. And that's exactly then what we would predict, and that is a difference between our pronunciations. Similarly, there's this question of the glottal stop gradually coming in in various syllable final environments. I certainly do use glottal stops in words like football, atmosphere, but Jane uses somewhat more of them than I do, and that too reflects our pronunciation. A moment ago, when we were talking privately, she used the expression, it has to, but she pronounced it, it has to, with a glottal stop, it has to. Now, I don't use glottal stop before H. I do before various other consonants, but not before H. She represents the next stage, which quite logically treats H as a consonant and extends this process just one little bit further so that it comes in phrases like it has to. Do you want to add anything to that? Um, I'd just like to add a, add a, 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 a slight warning, if you like. Um, although I do say sure, there are some places where I don't, I do have an ur. This tends to be after a y sound. So I wouldn't say pure, for example, I'd say pure. So Again, it's a, it's a kind of a gradual thing. I do know people who say pure, but I'm not one of them. So it's interesting. If you actually listen to the way people speak, you can hear lots of differences in the way people speak, even though they actually sound rather similar on the surface of it. I'm trying to think of another example. Well, I, I'll give you some, because it's very difficult, actually, to study these sound changes when they are still in progress. It would be, would be much better if we, if we could come back in 200 years and we know then what the final <laughs> end point was going to be. Okay, the moment, did I end up saying that? No. At the moment, we're just really not sure. You see, I did this in my survey. I asked people about the word jury, J-U-R-Y, 12 citizens to decide in a court. And I said, I, 
couldn't use technical terms, I didn't want to use phonetic symbols, so I said, does it rhyme with story, jory, which is one possibility. Then I said, does it rhyme with furry, furry animals, animals with fur, so jury, or does it rhyme with neither of those? And if it's jury, still, then clearly it rhymes with neither of them. A big majority voted for rhymes with neither of them. There were votes for all three possibilities, and actually jury came out slightly ahead of jury. But the majority said neither of them. Of course, we don't really know what they meant by neither. They could be saying things like jury, which is a sort of long, ooh, and how do we phonemicize that? Do we really have an ur in the system still? All the evidence is that ur is disappearing from the system. But perhaps what it's leaving behind is that ooh thing, which is then an allophone of ooh, just the special kind of ooh that you use before r. So jury, and it'll then come in purity and jury and various other words like that, and might indeed influence pure that you were speaking of, because pure and purity would be likely to behave the same. Furious, curious, not necessarily furious and curious, although there are people who say that. I'm, I'm not sure where that sound change is going. Now you're saying sure. Is that what I said? <laughs> Good! <laughs> That's what I said. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> Well, I mean, 
when you transcribe. I'm not sure that it is the reason. Daniel Jones, uh, from what he says, implies that the air diphthong tended to have a rather opener starting point than A and the short vowel F. And indeed, there are some speakers for whom it sounds like A, ah, the AE digraph, A. Ah. That's now rather archaic. People don't say share things anymore. They say share or indeed share. So maybe that's where that notation comes from. But it is handy that it means if we want to show long A as a monophone, we can use a cardinal three symbol and a length mark. Uh, we get into complications if we use the cardinal two symbol with a length mark. Shared and shed then become a length only minimal pair. I shared my food and put it in the shed. Shared, shed. Uh, the pronunciation of dictum is always the adversary. So the other thing is that the uh, dictums are really very unstable. In the old English, there were three dictums, but they all smooth or monophthongized. And in the new English, I think the, the new dictums were created. So they uh, can really the fact that the pronunciation changes from the uh, sure to show sure or sure to tall. What the pronunciation should be in the future? I mean, the, the dictumization occur again? I mean, the, the breaking or dictumization occur? Well, in the very long term, yes, presumably. <coughs> the trouble about historical linguistics in general is we don't have a theory of it that is watertight. If we had a real theory of language change in the scientific sense, we would be able to predict the future. But clearly we can't do that with confidence. So to that extent we haven't got a satisfactory theory of language change. Nevertheless, in English, it is very instructive <coughs> to compare what happens in received pronunciation on the one hand with what happens in Australian English on the other hand. Because in many respects, Australian English seems to be sort of like English with the brakes taken off, uh, where they are not held back in the way we are in our rather prim English way, but they go out into the wide open spaces <laughs> and <coughs> cast off all restraints. And of course the Australians have monophthongized. They say not uh, beer to drink, but beer. And they don't say square, they indeed say square. They don't say poor, they say poor if they're not going to have poor, which they can also have. So that does certainly suggest that monophthongs are the first target. Once of course you've got a monophthong, then it can enter into all the various uh, vowel shifts that have gone on in English throughout history. Uh, the most striking one, of course, in Australia, as in London, is then the vowel shift that changes A into I, changes I into OI, and changes OI into OI. So this ends up being my toy rather than my tie. And I would imagine that that is likely to become standard in Britain within the next 200 or 300 years. But we're not going to be here to see whether I'm right or wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Which actually again provides another neat segue for us. Learn this word segue. It means a musical transition from one tune to the next. S-E-G-U-E. <coughs> it's really addressed to me. It says you published the first edition of the Pronunciation Dictionary about ten years ago. What do you think is the shortest span of time for changes in pronunciation to come into effect? <coughs> And which changes most, or should we say fastest, in language, pronunciation, meaning, or grammar? And the problem is one of measuring things. How can you possibly compare like with like if we're talking about pronunciation changes, grammar changes, and vocabulary changes? Well, it's difficult. Let's start off with pronunciation changes then, because fortunately I have got one or two facts to bring in at least as far as the question of individual words is concerned. Because there are at least two words that I had in my 1988 survey, and I've also got in my 1998 survey, so ten years apart. This, for example, applies to the question of the stress placement in the word that is either controversy or controversy. Now, in 1988, 56% of my sample voted for controversy. Ten years later, it was 60% for controversy, which means that there was an increase in 4%. Now, 
Now, they may, may not be absolutely comparable samples and so on, but let's ignore that. That suggests a change of 4% in 10 years, which means 40% in 100 years, which means 100% in 250 years. So that particular item looks as if it would take 250 years to go from the first few people to say controversy until everybody says controversy. Of course, life is not like that. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, the other word that, <coughs> again, we could extrapolate from is kilometre or kilometre, where, <coughs> again, for the first survey, it was 48% voted for kilometre. By the time of the second one, it was 57%. So the balance has changed, and that's actually a 9% change again, in only 10 years. Now, if we gross that up, it means you get 100% in just over a century, 110 years. That, I think, is more realistic. The fact of the matter is that most individuals don't really change much in the course of their lifetime. Certainly by the time they are 14, 15, or in some cases, at least by the time they're 20, everything is fixed. For many people, it's fixed earlier than that. It's fixed by nine or 10. But they then, if they have a typical lifespan, spend another 50 or 60 years being around. Meanwhile, further generations are coming, and they may have got their changes. But it means that even if the change is abrupt from the point of view of one year to the next of children, it's going to take 60, 70 years to work through society, just because people are still there in society. They don't, we don't have an instant change of the population. So no sound change is going to really take effect in much less than about a hundred years. And we must always bear that in mind. Nothing is instantaneous, particularly in pronunciation. And I think even more in, uh, if we're talking about things like glottal stops coming in, diphthongs becoming monophthongs and so on, that does take at least a hundred years really to take thorough effect. Vocabulary can be much more instantaneous because we all go on learning vocabulary throughout our life. Ten years ago, I didn't know the word website because the word website hadn't been invented. Now I do know it and I use it. And there are many other similar words. We can all acquire new vocabulary. So that can be instantaneous. Changes in vocabulary, if it's just a matter of adding words and forgetting words, that's straightforward. Do we really change vocabulary? Well. Yes, we stop talking about swine and start talking about pigs. There are things like that, but I, I don't know how to measure that kind of change because very typically you have a long period of overlap during which both words are in use. Grammatical change, again, I think on the whole, tends to be like pronunciation change in that people stick with more or less the same grammar throughout life. But don't forget, in both grammar and in pronunciation, the importance of stylistic variation. That we don't have one monolithic form of English or whatever language. We have the possibility of varying. We have a casual style, we have a careful style. That applies certainly in pronunciation and certainly in grammar. In my casual grammar, I can use theirs with a plural subject. There's lots of things to do. In my more formal style, in writing, I probably would avoid it and say there are lots of things to do. Similarly, in pronunciation, I have casual pronunciations, which I wouldn't use in careful speech. So that too means that changes are not instantaneous. The evidence, such as it is, suggests that things typically progress from being casual to being everyday. And what was one generation's casual speech is the next generation's everyday speech. Do you want to add anything to that <coughs> general question? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else want to come in on that? Well, uh, I think that uh, oh, consonants are more resistant to change. It does look like that, doesn't it? Yes. And, and most of the cha uh, changes that we find in phonetics are concerned with vowels, for instance, after or after or yeah. you know, a half, half. Uh, they, are, they all represent dialectal uh, differences. So 
regional or social. Uh, uh, whereas the uh, consonant or the, the consonant frame remains, you know, more or less the same. Yes, yeah, so not entirely the same. R and L, yeah. H, and of course glottal stops interfering yeah. with things. But you're right. But I wonder, is this a parochial fact about English? Or is this a universal tendency in all languages? What applies in Japanese? What are the differences between different kinds of Japanese? Vowels or consonants or pitch pattern or all of them? All of them. I mean, this is a serious question, and I don't think I have enough information to answer it, certainly without looking up things in books. What about the Polynesian languages, where we've got, you know, from New Zealand up to Hawaii, through a lot of little different islands, we speak of all these different languages, Tongan, Fijian, and so on. They're all subtly different from one another, but they all share a great deal. As far as I remember, the main differences are consonantal. They're concerned with, you know, whether you have an H or whether you have a glottal stop, whether you have an R or whether you have an L, whether you have a P or a B or an M, <coughs> rather than vowels. The vowel system is pretty constant. I think that's <coughs> generally true of Bantu languages as well. If we compare Zulu, Swahili, uh, there are several hundred Bantu languages, they almost all have the same vowel system. On the whole, they tend to have the same vowels in the same words. What they differ in is the consonants. So it could be that it's just an oddity about English that our main difference is of vowels. Perhaps because we have so many vowels, we have such a complex vowel system, and it's so unbalanced, which it is, compared with that of many languages. Your language, Japanese, has a nice balanced system with five vowels, all clearly distinct from one another, nicely symmetrical in arrangement. English is not like that, and that's why our vowels are so unstable. I think it's time for Jane to answer a question, so this is one addressed to her about your more accounting. Oh yes, the more accounting. Okay, first of all, um, the question says to Professor Setter, I wonder why Gen was described as one mora, whereas San as two in Gen Kotoyama no Tanaki-san. Um, aren't both of these the case of two moras? Well, yes and no. Um, <coughs> as far as um, well, first of all, it's not my analysis. It's actually the analysis of the music. Um, it goes gen kotsu yama no. It doesn't go gen kotsu. So um, we find that the music itself is only providing one note, one beat for both of those more, both of those. But for the end of it, we've got san. We've got it actually separated into two. So it's not my personal distinction, it's actually what the music does. Um, does anyone want to disagree with that? No. So, um, so first of all, it's not my analysis, but I think what I said is um, certainly true. Japanese people perceive the mora as an important unit of timing. And it's perceived as an important unit. And if you hear something as a unit of timing, if you perceive it as such, then it is important. It's important to you. Another question I had concerning this is uh, you said they've been proven not to exist. Well, that's not really what I said. Um, the point is that units of timing that we've been talking about, like moras and syllables, um, if you've got a syllable time language, if you've got a stress time language, the units of timing are taken to be the mora or the syllable or between stresses as being regular. And the instrumental studies um, have shown that when speakers produce speech, all kinds of speech, Japanese speech, um, syllable time speech, and stress-based speech, it's actually been shown that um, there's not this regularity, that English stress syllables don't all fall on a beat like this, because if they did, it would sound rather silly. So we don't speak like that. As I demonstrated, we don't go around talking like rap artists. We don't do that. Um, for it to be regular, we'd have to sound more like that kind of thing. So instrumental studies have shown that this regularity is not as regular. Ah, there's my bit wrong. Regularity is not as regular 
as, as people perceive it to be. But because people perceive it to be regular, that's what makes it important. That's what people listen for. So um, the analysis in the song, we've actually, um, the question is whether Japanese is analyzable in terms of syllables or whether you have to analyze it in terms of mori. And there are different mori or moris. There are, there are different um, approaches to this. Some people say, well, you can look at it from syllable structure because you can do that. You can say if you've got a more nasal, it ends a syllable. You can do that. Or you can look at it by saying, well, this more nasal is a separate unit of timing in its own right. You can do that too. And there's question over which is the best approach. But ultimately, if Japanese people think that more is are important, then you have to address that when you're learning Japanese. You have to understand that that's important. So it's not my analysis. It's just how the song works. <laughs> well, uh, let me add something. Well, I'm not, uh, I don't claim to be a specialist on Japanese dialects, but those people, those phonologists uh, who are working on Japanese dialects uh, seem to think that we have to uh, talk about dialectal differences. We can't talk of, you know, the Japanese language. Uh, they say that Tokyo dialect, for instance, uh, use, uh, relies on syllable structure, whereas uh, the dialect in in the Kansai area, use both syllable structure and more structure. And in your dialect, which I don't remember, well, I, I don't remember the name of the dialect, uh, in that dialect, it's only more structure that counts. Mm -hmm. So we have to, uh, you know, we have mixture of you know, stru different structures in different dialects. Yes. It's, you know, it's really complicated mm -hmm. to understand. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is complicated, yes. yes. The fact that moraic nasals and moraic obstruents can't begin a word also seems to me to be relevant, mm. because that is syllable-like behaviour. <coughs> you can express this easily in terms of syllables, they're found at the end of syllables. You can't explain it easily if you don't have any unit between the mora and the, the word or something. So I feel, in order to account for the facts of Japanese as I understand them, you do need to make reference to a syllable as well as to a mora. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, for this particular um, song, <coughs> Nasal Demo, um, I think you have to be uh, differentiate between the uh, nasal at the even numbered position and uh, odd numbered position. Ah. Because again, uh, the first uh, nasal uh, uh, happens on the second of the syllable, <coughs> and the four units, nasal, larger units, and again, uh, the term of Sahin begins another key, so it can stand on its own. So uh, if you have um, even number of words, and then you have an N at the end, then it can stand on its own. So uh, it could be, uh, if you think, then it could be Yes, the, this, this example is um, given in the textbook that I was reading, um, I think, to demonstrate yeah, this is exactly true. Yes, yes. that it can be either the end of a syllable or it can be seen as a unit in its own right, wh which is still at the end of a syllable in some, some ways of looking at it. Um, it was just that particular example was quite nice because it had both examples. But I, I, don't, I, can't, I don't know anything about Japanese song structure, so I can't really comment on that. Um, I do know that, as far as the haiku is concerned, um, from that I believe that there's no instances where a mora nasal would, or a mora consonant would be included in a syllable. From what I understand about that, if you have a haiku, it's always a separate thing. There's no two ways it's about more it. Amazed. Yes, it's more a base. So, I mean, this again argues to the psychological reality of moras for, for Japanese speakers. <coughs> Almost half of the syllabic consonants in contemporary English are the phonetic implementation of nasal release and lateral release. What is the main reason for this? People always want reasons, don't they? <coughs> well, first of all, I think we have to ask whether the first statement is true, whether this claim is true, and secondly, we can try and think of why it might be if it is true. 
I'm not convinced that it is true. <coughs> the point is there are a lot of words like bottle, middle, where you have, yes, lateral release before a syllabic consonant, and likewise words like button and garden, where you have it uh, a nasal release before a syllabic consonant. Uh, that's because in that particular environment we do very much favour a syllabic consonant. My view of syllabic consonants is that they are derived from schwa plus a consonant, and whether or not you apply the rule of syllabic consonant formation depends upon the environment. Some environments favour it, other environments disfavour it. Others are fairly neutral and you can do both things. Did you notice Jane sometimes saying important and then sometimes saying important? Well, she was thereby demonstrating that both options in fact apply in the environment you're talking about. Talking about a very useful example, aren't you? Yes, <laughs> this is what she doesn't like when we talk about one another. <laughs> But that means that even though this is an environment that admittedly favours it, it doesn't favour it in the sense of making it obligatory. It just makes it relatively likely, but not obligatory. There are many other environments where, again, there's a choice. Uh, I was thinking about fricatives, a preceding fricative. Words like seven, often, listen, dozen, cushion. Now, I think I tend to use a syllabic consonant there, but there are plenty of other people who say seven, often, cushion, and so on. And that's perfectly good. Listen. It's also, listen, yes, it's also very difficult sometimes to decide which they've said. Was that listen or was it listen? Well, those are the polar extremes, but there's some kind of listen in the middle where you're really not sure which it was. And it's going to depend upon counting these up to decide whether the claim made in this question, first of all, is true. Well, let's not quibble, let's assume it is true that most syllabic consonants involve nasal release or lateral release. What's the reason for this? Well, the reason must just be that a preceding alveolar plosive is one of the most favouring environments for the rule of syllabic consonant formation. If T and D favour it much more than other possible preceding consonants, then inevitably you're going to get lateral release and nasal release, because if it's a P or a B or a K or a G or a Ch or a J or a fricative of some kind, well then it's not going to give you these special releases. And if the claim is true, then you don't get it so often in those environments. So it's a kind of circular thing. Comments on that? <laughs> no, no. I. I just I wonder whether it is true that yeah, that I, I percentage think, is. I think it probably is not true. Sure. No, I think I mean we'd actually need to start getting people to say these words and then counting them up and see uh, if it's just a, a feeling. Then, but, but why are we doing this? <laughs> I mean we could do it for some instrumental reason, um, but I think it's. I, I don't. I don't think. Uh, it's interesting because, again, it res relates to universal trends rather than special facts about English. But it's about how facts of English relate to universal trends. And it concerns glottal reinforcement. Why does glottal reinforcement occur in syllable final position? That is to say that syllable final position, cross-linguistically, is typically a lenition site. That means a place where consonants get weaker. So it seems rather perverse that in English we often strengthen consonants by preglottalizing them, reinforcing them. Why should this be? <laughs> well, why should it be? It's very difficult. I and mean, you see, there's nothing like having a good fact to puzzle people who love theories. And this is a typical phonologist's claim that syllable final position is where you get lenition. And if you adduce facts to them, they will start looking embarrassed and say, we'll set that fact aside because it's not of theoretical interest, or something like that. This is what the Chomskyans very typically say. If you find a counterexample for anything, they say, well, there may be this or that parochial counterexample, but I'm interested in the big universal trends. On the face of it, this is absolutely a counterexample to that claim. On the other hand, the questioner goes on to suggest an explanation, which seems to me a very plausible one. 
namely that it's to do with preserving the opposition between voiceless and voiced final plosives. Now, in English, unlike in German, say, we have lots of minimal pairs that depend upon the difference between T and D at the end of a syllable, between bat and bad, uh, between back and bag. This depends upon voicing, of course, voiceless versus voice, but we know that English tends, because of universal tendency of remission, not really to voice very much, the pl voice plosives in final position. So there is a risk that you would lose the distinction. If you start instead of bag, saying bag, it's going to start to sound like back. And one way to reinforce the difference between them is to use glottalization in the case of the voiceless ones, back, but not in the case of the voiced ones. And that's what we do. So I think that's a very plausible explanation. Do you like that explanation? Sounds good to me. Yeah. Oh, I just wanted to. Uh, <laughs> if we have uh, uh, differences in the length of vowels, uh, we can tell which word is used. Uh, you know, we don't have to know there is a consonant at the end. Uh, if if the, uh, there is a difference between the, uh, the vowel lengths. That's right. I mean, that's the argument that precisely that's why we have these clipping rules, this difference in duration. Bag has a longer vowel, back has a shorter one, dependent on kugga. Why do we mess around in this way? Well, partly it is a universal tendency, but in English it's clearly exaggerated compared with many other languages. We have phonologized it. Why? In order to reinforce the kugga to the opposition. Well, actually, there was a further question. Do you want to make well, one? I just wanted to say that um, this, this is one of the big problems for my Cantonese speakers of English, because Cantonese has um, a lot of glottal stopping. It has Cantonese syllable structure is, is quite similar in a lot of ways to Japanese syllable structure in what you can have at the end of a syllable if you're looking at it from a syllable point of view. You can have um, either a nasal consonant, you can actually have a mm, a mm or a mm. You can also have those in Japanese um, as realizations of more a nasal. Or you can have a voiceless but unreleased bilabial alveolar or velar stop consonant. Um, these are strongly glottalized. The stop consonants are very quite strongly glottalized. Tell them the name of the new airport. The new airport. <laughs> Jet like cop. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, you, unless you see, unless you see um, bilabial closure, you, you can't know whether it's a uh, lap, you can't know if it's a, an unreleased p, and you can't tell if it's a unreleased k, or a, in a lot of cases, you can't tell. Um, the <laughs> it's a great name, isn't it? The, um, the, the problem with, with, uh, with English, of course, is that if you glottalize your final plosive or stop consonants, you are indicating that it's a voiceless sound. So my speakers are unable to make a difference between back and bag. They say them both bat and bat. <laughs> and it's very difficult. And this, this is one of the things that I'm looking at in, in my thesis, actually. But it's, it's very interesting. Um, uh, let me see. Hot and hod, for example, <laughs> not that you'd want to say hod. They can't make differences between these things. And I think also um, Singapore English is known for being heavily glottalized. It has lots of glottal stopping in it. Um, this seems to be a feature of some Chinese Englishes. Uh, Mandarin doesn't have this problem because Mandarin doesn't permit anything other than a nasal at the end of a syllable. So it's very, it's, it's an interesting thing, and it's something that arises in non-native varieties of English too. That's the other question. The other question concerns what I call T, this epithetic T, uh, the phenomenon that applies in words like fence, N plus S sounds at the end, but many people pronounce them fence, intruding, if you like, a T between the N and the S. And in general, between a nasal and a voiceless fricative, you get a plosive agreeing in place with a nasal. Humphrey becomes Humphrey, emphasis becomes emphasis, conscience becomes conscience. Now. The general view is that this is on the increase, both mm, in American English and in British English. It probably is another of the differences between yeah. your speech and mine that you do it, I don't do it. But at least I can stop myself, unlike your actors. Right. <laughs> you see, when I was little and my mother sent me out to buy some mince, 
I knew to I knew that I had to come back with meat, mince meat. But if she sent me out to buy some mints, I would come back with sweets. <laughs> but I think mothers children, your mother wouldn't be able to rely on that difference at all, <laughs> would she? Maybe I'd need to know what she was cooking first. Yes. <laughs> it's a slightly contrived example, but I think it's true. Well, this too, you see, seems to go against this universal tendency to weaken syllable-final positions. So the, we have the question, why? Why? Well, you can give them the explanation in terms of timing of articulatory movement, so would you like me to? No, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <coughs> to get from n to s, think what you have to do with your organs of speech. You're making n. Tongue tip on alveolar ridge, complete closure. Soft palate down, vocal cords vibrating, air streaming out through the nose. <coughs> now, we want to change this to s. That means the soft palate's got to go up. Vocal cords have got to stop vibrating, and the tongue tip has got to come away to allow the air over, to allow the air to pass over the tongue tip. Three changes. We can actually ignore the voicing one. That can happen because of aerodynamic changes in pressure and so on. That's not a problem. But it's absolutely crucial which movement happens first of the soft palate or the tongue tip. In order to get the older pronunciation, fence, what must happen first? The first thing must be the tongue tip. It must release its contact, and you get a moment of nasalized S. Fence. Then you finish the movement of the soft palate, and you've got fence. If you get the timing wrong by a millisecond, there will be a moment during which the air can't get out through the nose and can't get out through the mouth. Fence. <laughs> and that's the condition for recognizing a T. So a very fine difference of timing is sufficient to trigger this difference. Why it, it should be on the increase is not altogether explained by this explanation, but at least it tells us why it's a likely thing to happen. Well, uh, that's my question, but uh, uh, Jonas Kingston of the University of Massachusetts said the same thing about the rules of what I said. I mean, uh, signaling the uh, T, uh, I mean, the voicelessness of S. Yeah. Um, that's what he said. Right, so it's making the difference between fence and fens, plural of fen. Yes. Or in American English, dance versus dams belonging to dam. I suppose it's reasonable because you don't intrude a, uh, a T or anything really between M and a, a voiced uh, fricative. It doesn't altogether explain why we do it in other places. And by, I mean, words like conscience, it's not competing with any conscience possibility. In emphasis, there's no possibility. I suppose there is a possibility, a lot of possibility of emphasis, envy, words like that. It's not a very uh, very powerful, uh, not much uh, functional load attached to that contrast, is there? Anyhow, we can continue to speculate, and I doubt if anybody can prove us wrong. I wonder if uh, people are uh, you know, speaking faster than they used to a century ago. Than, than <laughs> <laughs> well, this would be very difficult to measure. How are you going to measure that? Yes. Yeah, there must be also uh, you know, uh, phonographs. Uh, in the early days, making a phonographic record was very difficult. You had to speak very clearly uh, and rather yeah. loudly, or else the machine would not be able to record <laughs> accurately what you were doing. <laughs> the fact that we can now chat into a microphone reflects increases in technology. <laughs> All right. Uh, we got time for some more? Uh, or we've got three more, I don't know if we have time for all of them. Th there are, yeah, there are, they're really more technical term, technical questions. Um, one asks, when the place of stress marks in a transcription coincides with the place for intonation marks, can we write the stress marks next to the intonation marks? Well, you can do anything you like, really. The convention in the O'Connor and Arnold system is no, you replace a stress mark by an intonation mark, which is in some sense more explicit and uh, accepting the odd uh, prehead implies a combination of stress plus some pitch movement. So the stress marking alone is a kind of rough statement, and intonation marking is a more precise statement, and the intonation mark does indeed replace the stress mark. On the other hand, if you want to use Halliday's notation, for example, then you can do them both. If you are foolish enough to try and use Brazel's notation, <laughs> um, you will end up in a terrible mess, but that's true anyhow, because if you try and make the lines go up and down and God knows what else.
else indicating key and so on. It may be very insightful, but it's a very bad notation system in my view. What is the difference between tonic nuclear and stress? And what's the difference between tone group and breath group? Well, partly the difference, I think, is a matter of the terminology used by a given author. When I say nucleus of an intonation group, I'm meaning the same thing as Halliday means by speaking of the tonic, or some American authors mean by speaking of the intonation center, or other people may mean by other things like sentence stress or main sentence stress. We're all talking about the same thing. I have the O'Connor and Arnold University College tradition where we distinguish between stress and accent in that stress is this matter of rhythmic beats. Accent involves the combination of stress with some kind of intonational prominence. So that stresses after the nucleus, for example, are still stressed. Uh, good morning, Mr. Jenkinson. Mr. Jenkinson, they're still rhythmic beats, but they're not accents. They don't have intonational prominence. They just lower level, unimportant. Whereas earlier accents, accents in general, combine pitch movement and emphasis to rhythmic beats. People use the word stress in a number of different ways, though, and uh, you just have to see how the author defines it. I have also experimented with such expressions as tonic stress or intonational stress rather than accent. As far as tone group and breath group are concerned, well, again, what do you call the chunks into which you divide a longer piece? If they're intonational chunks, we can call them tone groups. Some people call them tone units. There are other terms as well, aren't there? <laughs> Anyhow. Well, I call my tone units. Okay, tone <laughs> groups or tone units. Um, breath groups may well coincide with them, but breath groups must surely be defined in physiological terms. Breath groups, you take breaths between breath groups. Ready to say what comes next, and then something else. Now, depending on the speed at which you speak, you typically don't take breaths at every boundary between tone groups, tone units but only for some of them. Likewise, pauses. Well, if a pause is a real complete cessation of a silence, not all boundaries between tone units are necessarily pauses, but some of them will be. And at least there's the potential for a pause. I would say that between successive tone units, tone groups, there is the potential for a pause, and there's the potential to take a breath. But I wouldn't want to define them in those terms. I think I find that breath group, breath group is sometimes used in a synonymous way with tone unit. I, I do find that it does get used like that sometimes. Um, I I can see the point of using it. Um, I mean, sometimes I say to my students, "Okay, this is when you've run out of breath, so you need to, <laughs> so you've got another unit." But it's possible to ha to have several tone units and not actually have a breath at all. In fact, um, I've just done a couple. It's possible to do that, but in some cases you do see that it's used in a that they're used as um, synonymous terms. I've seen that before, um, but generally speaking, I'm more interested in the intonation pattern. I'm not interested in whether my speakers are blue in the face because they've run out of breath or not. So I would I'd stick to the term tone units. And when they're all gasping for air on the floor, then I will let them take a breath. Isn't that me? No, but I'm asphyxia as a phonetic unit. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> But I think, um, I think if you're interested in intonation, you want to say tone unit or tone group, really. Um, breath group, I think it can be misleading because it could mean when you take a breath and when you take a breath <laughs> might be one or two or more tone units. So. Oh, here's another old favourite. The last question that I've got in <coughs> those you handed in concerns the definition of the term sonorant. Now, one definition of sonorant refers to the possibility of spontaneous voicing, so that nasals, liquids, and glides are sonorant. I think we know what book this person has been reading. Uh, but another definition uh, would refer to auditory characteristics. So the question is, is it to do with physiology, production of sounds, or is it to do with the characteristics of the sounds that are produced by this? And in this 
auditory definition, then nasals and liquids are sonorants, but not glides. Of course, the term glide is controversial as well, because Chomsky and Halley treat semivowels and H and glottal stop all as being glides, which may work fine in the phonetics to phonology of Arabic, but uh, looks a bit strange, at least from the physiological point of view. The question to us is, what do you think about the term? Off you go, Jane. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have to admit, I'm not a big fan of phonology in the heavy sense, so I don't think anything of the term at all, but I have been asked to um, think about it for my thesis, hooray, so I've got to think about so uh, sonority. For, from my point of view, I'm interested in um, why speakers think something has actually got two syllables when it's only got one. Um, something with a group of consonants that starts with, a, with an S, for example, like um, spin, somebody would, uh, it, it's been said that an S is highly sonorant, so you've actually got two sonorant, you've got two peaks there, and that kind of thing is of interest to me. Um, but aside from that, sonority is not something that I would even worry about because I don't teach it and I'm not, I'm not really into that kind of thing. At Perhaps you better explain to people about the sonority hierarchy because not everybody may know about The this. sonority hierarchy. Um, well, I think it's supposed to be vowels. Vowels are most sonorant, um, followed by voiced and then, no, hang on, followed by yeah, nasal, liquids. liquids and um, semi-vowels. Semi <coughs> Thank you, John. <laughs> 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 no, really, this really isn't something that, that I know much about at all. Followed by voiced and then voiceless fricatives, and then followed by stop fuzzing. Yeah. So that, that's it. I mean, this is something that's really new to me, because phonology is not my bag, man. So I think, John, you can explain the well, rest. Well, yeah, I mean, that's <laughs> a sonority hierarchy. The term sonorant <laughs> implies a binary division, so that sounds are either sonorant or they're not. And that, of course, doesn't fit in with this hierarchy where there are five or six different steps along it. So the question really is, how far up do we take the binary term sonorant to go? Now, for my purposes, I'm really interested in how it can be applied to phonetics of languages I'm familiar with, one of which is English. And in English, we do need to make the difference. Well, the opposite of sonorant is obstruent. Mm. So we've got this important difference in English between obstruent and sonorant because their voicing behavior is different. English obstruents typically come in pairs, voice and voiceless. This means plosives, affricates, fricatives. And we get all this business of devoicing of the Linus obstruents, the g, the the z, j, and so on. They tend to be devoiced if they're not surrounded by voiced sounds. So that's something we need to say about the obstruents, which we don't need to say about the sonorants, nasals, liquids. They don't undergo devoicing in this way. A word like lemon has got full voicing throughout all its consonants, unlike a word such as dog, which doesn't, because they are obstruents in dog, but they're sonorants in lemon. That's the practical application. The marginal case there that I'm not sure about is H. Is H a sonorant or is H an obstruent? It doesn't come with pairs, but it's voiceless anyhow, so the question of voicing doesn't matter very much. On the other hand, it does sometimes sort of get voiced between vowels when people say ahead or behind. You can get the voicing going straight through. So in that respect, it behaves like a sonorant. I uh, don't know that I really want to take it much further than that. I'm really prepared, I think, to bend these definitions language specifically. If it's helpful for one group of languages to have a natural class that includes dotal stops and H's and semivowels in the same group, then that's evidence that in some universal sense they can be so analysed, but it's not necessarily relevant for other languages. Well, uh, it's about time. Uh, I'm sure every one of you uh, felt a little bit in, you know, attending some course in London. <laughs> you know, isn't this a great opportunity? Uh, thank you very much.